Um, this, if you don't know it already, is the Walter Miller map. Um, <coughs> it's, the original is on display in the Jefferson uh, building in the Great Hall. If you haven't been over there to see it already, I strongly, strongly urge you to go do it. It's, uh, there's nothing like FaceTime with the real thing. There's only one copy that survives in the world. It's this one. Um, it's probably about that big. It's eight feet by four and a half feet, so that's, that's a reasonable um, facsimile of the real thing. It might even be a little bigger. Uh, so please go over there at some point. Um, as John <coughs> and John both suggested, I didn't know anything <laughs> about this map or the history of cartography when I started. Um, in 2003, when I was an editor and a writer at the Atlantic in Boston, opening my mail, I came across a press release from the library announcing that for $10 million it had bought what it called America's birth certificate, uh, the Walter Miller map, the map that gave America its name. Um, that $10 million was the most the library had ever spent on anything. Um, <clears throat> it was also almost $2 million more than had recently been paid for an original copy of the Declaration of Independence. And that, that kind of got my attention. I'd never heard of the map, I'd never seen the map, but the library seemed to think it was its most valuable piece, and the market even seemed to think that it was worth more than an original copy of the Declaration of Independence. So I, I wanted to find out more, and at this point I was thinking maybe I would do an, a, an article, a short piece for The Atlantic. Um, so I did some research and um, got the basics of the story pretty quickly. Um, early in the 1500s, uh, in the eastern part of France, in the Vosges Mountains, there was a small group of scholars, uh, among them the mapmaker Martin Waldsemuller, uh, and they came across letters by Amerigo Vespucci and some, at least one, early sailor's chart showing the coastlines of the New World, uh, <coughs> and they decided that um, what they were reading about and what they were seeing on these charts was not a part of Asia, as most people had assumed it was, but in fact was uh, a new continent. Um, people traditionally had thought of the world as having three parts, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Waldsemuller and his colleagues decided that this was a fourth part of the world, hence the title of the book. Um, <coughs> The, um, because they'd made that decision, uh, that it seemed to represent a fourth part of the world, it needed a name, just like the other continents had names, and they came up with the name America in honor of Amerigo Vespucci. Um, it's a great story. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, and we'll get into more of it a bit later. Um, but as I was looking into the map, I, I learned pretty quickly that it also is significant for a lot of other reasons, not just for the naming of America. Um, if you look on the left there, that's the New World, South America, and with North America above it. It's, this is really the first map to show North and South America unambiguously surrounded by water, um, not as some undefined part of Asia or just some undefined place that really isn't identified at all. Um, because it shows North and South America surrounded by water, it's really the first map to suggest the existence of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and this is something of mystery because Europeans aren't supposed to have known about the Pacific Ocean until 1513, uh, when Balboa it, caught sight of it from a mountaintop. So that's something that brings a lot of people back to the map. It's something that Peter has written about extensively. It's not something that I dwell on a whole lot in the book, because I felt that the mystery is almost more fun to leave as a mystery than to try to resolve. Um, but it's a great part of the story. It's not the only part of the story, though. There's more that is very, very significant about the map. Um, if you look at Africa, for example, this is one of the very first printed maps to show the full coastlines of Africa. Uh, Africa and <coughs> excuse me, um, had only been circumnavigated by the Portuguese fully uh, in 1497, um, and <coughs> maps were only beginning to show all of this. The frame at the bottom of the map here is broken. Uh, it would have been pretty easy just to push the frame down a little bit. I think the point's pretty clear. This is a break with tradition. This is new knowledge, and it's exciting possibly to a lot of you is more exciting than this stuff over on the left. People tend to forget that, but this is, this is a great discovery because it means you can sail from Europe around Africa and into the Indian Ocean and beyond. Um, even beyond that fact, though, is the fact that the map shows a full 360 degrees of longitude. Um, it's one of the very first to do that as well. Maps prior to this one had tended to leave a certain portion of the globe unmapped, uh, kind of implied on the back of the map, as it were, and the implication was generally that it was just kind of uncharted oceanic space and you didn't really need to try to depict it. Here uh, is one of the very first pictures of the world 
<coughs> laid out in a full 360 degrees. And what we're seeing, therefore, is a, is a picture of the world roughly as we know it today. It's obviously not fully correct. It's distorted and is full of um, misconceptions and deliberately um, odd juxtapositions. But it is basically a vision of the world that we've been refining ever since. Uh, and that, to me, was really what struck me. This is not just a map that's announcing the existence of the new world. It's a map that's declaring, hey, we can now uh, see the whole world for the first time. So great story. I thought this, was, this would be a great article. I put some clippings in a little article idea folder that I kept. And then I got sidetracked by other things for a couple of years. Um, and only in 2005, when uh, word came down that the Atlantic was going to be moved from Boston to Washington, did I start to try to think about the map again, and I did because I wanted to make a living in Boston, not move to Washington. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, and when I went back to my article idea folder, I had a brilliant idea. I would uh, write a little book about the making of this map, and, and it would come out in 2007, timed perfectly to coincide with the 500th anniversary of the naming of America. Um, and I barely made it to 2009. <laughs> so. Um, what happened? Why, why did it take me longer than I expected? Um, the simple answer is I just got sucked in. Uh, and I thought when I came to the map that I was going to be focusing on the New World and particularly this naming of America. Um, very quickly, as John suggested, I started uh, just seeing more and more in the map and feeling as though there was an opportunity to, to, a, to do a much more comprehensive book that would survey the map as a whole um, and, and, and could be an excuse for doing a kind of uh, ge geographical and intellectual adventure story with the map kind of as the backdrop. Um, so it, w what struck me most was that it wasn't just one world that's depicted here. It's actually many worlds. And if you just change your perspective this way or that, it's kind of like a kaleidoscope. And you can tease out different stories, uh, different collisions of ideas, um, different mysteries as well. Um, and I wanted to do something that was um, sort of uh, complex enough that it would do the map in full justice. Um, even if you've never seen this map before or don't know maps of this period, it's pretty easy, I think, to see what we're looking at. Um, North is at the top, and that uh, in this period wasn't necessarily always the case. We assume today that North is always at the top, but there were plenty of maps that didn't put North at the top. Uh, over here, therefore, is the east, and this is Japan way up here. This is <coughs> part of what we would now call the Pacific. This is China, <coughs> India, Central Asia, the Middle East, Europe up here, Africa, obviously. And then this is the most famous part of the map, probably North America up here, maybe the Gulf of Mexico here. These are the islands of the Caribbean. This is kind of the region that Columbus explored. And then this big, big, long, thin landmass is South America. Um, the dominant visual uh, impression you get from looking at the New World is this s giant southern place. And that's, um, that's really what was making an impression on Europeans in the early days of discovery. It wasn't so much the westness of the New World. It was obviously uh, Columbus had pioneered a great new route across the Atlantic, but he thought he had reached Asia. So he, w he and just about everybody thought that he'd confirmed old geographical ideas. South America, which um, <coughs> excuse me, Amerigo Vespucci wrote about um, in the late 1490s and early 1500s, um, extended far into the south into a part of the globe that people tended to think there wasn't any land in. Uh, and that made a big impression. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, what dominates uh, the map then is this southern part, and that's why Martin Valsimilla, the cartographer, put the word America on uh, the southern continent along the shores that Amerigo Vespucci sailed along. If you, you, you this, the word America is here, I'll zero in on it. Um, it's probably on what today would be considered Brazil, right there. That's the first use of the word. These guys made the name up and then put it on the map. Um, as I said, though, there's much, much more to the map than just this depiction of the new world. And I wanted to do a book that, for a general reader, for somebody like me, who was reasonably well informed but really didn't know anything about the map or the history of early world mapping, um, would read and learn uh, as much as possible from. 
And I wanted to <coughs> come up with a way of making it a kind of um, gripping narrative